name is Brian and today I'm going to talk about how to install, in, assemble Tiny Timer Kickstarter Edition. Uh, this is a Kickstarter project that I launched about nine months ago and the assembly technique that I'm going to show today is different from what's in the official manual. The official manual will work just fine however after putting 20 of these together um, I've come up with a slightly faster way to do this and so I wanted to just document this in case some of the uh, backers or buyers of the kit who wanted to um, put it together would, would see how I'm doing it. Um, so the reason I've assembled 20 of these is because that's how many backers had ordered them assembled. So I'm holding one that is operating and I just wanted to show very quickly how Tiny Timer works. So there's a jumper switch here and you just simply move the jumper switch over to the program and it puts it into program mode and you can use the next button to move between the different uh, digits and different cycles and the red digit sets the entire cycle time or I'm saying the red LED indicates you're setting the, the entire cycle time and the green LED indicates that you're setting the run time and the timer will automatically calculate how long the, the idle phase is. So if I have a 10 minute cycle with 5 minutes on, it will calculate that it should wait for 5 minutes while, um, before starting the next cycle. And that's nice because you don't, you don't have to think about it. Uh, by default it works in tenths of a second. So um, if it is in mode 0, which is what this green digit indicates, that it will be in, you're, you're measuring tenths of a second, uh, mode one is seconds, mode two is minutes, mode three is hours, mode four is days. And uh, so what's nice about Tiny Timer is I can do something really um, bizarre like, you know, every 144 hours run a cycle for 36.5 seconds. And there's no other timer on the market that is this easy to set that offers this much flexibility in the modes. Everything else is um, you, you have a limited selection of modes and you have a limited amount of granularity or you have to build it and program it yourself. And so this is designed uh, for the maker community. It also has a input which is documented so you could go in and modify this and change the program to suit some other application. And it has a logic output so that if you wanted to hook up an SSR, uh, I, I don't have one I can reach. Yeah, I do. So here is a SSR. This is a solid state relay. Uh, this solid state relay will handle um, 25 amps at up to 380 volts AC. So uh, that'll handle just about anything you can come up with um, uh, from an air conditioning unit to a, uh, to a space heater. Um, <clears throat> And best of all, this is based on the Arduino IDE platform, so it's very easy to program. There's a ton of libraries that are out there for it, and it uses a standard six-pin in-system programming header. Um, and you can buy a programming board for as little as $10. Um, and because this is open source, you can download the schematics, the documentation, and the, the example code, which is what I, I ship on these when they're fully assembled. So without further ado, let me show you how I put these together. Um, I print off what I call the pick sheet, and I'll just hold this up so you can see what's on it. It's just a list of the parts, and then I put all of the parts into a little plastic bin. It happens to be a parts bin out of my parts rack, um, and uh, let me put this back in run mode and set it over here off to the side. And uh, that's essentially, this is how I get organized. I use a Hacko 936. Um, this is an analog soldering station. It's worked reasonably well. I'm using a um, Kester, oh, what is this? Yeah, this is a standard tin and lead solder. So um, it's not gonna qualify for rows with this assembly, but that's okay. Um, um, so the first thing you need to do is you need to take the circuit board and you need to trim off. Sometimes there's nubs from this from the manufacturing process, and you use a pair of cutters like this, and you just simply 
uh, trim off the uh, the nubs if there are any and uh, get down to a really nice clean circuit board for assembly. And now I'm going to refocus the camera uh, so that you can actually see what I'm doing. Okay, so first things first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out the pieces that I'm going to install in the first wave. So the both ICs, uh, both LEDs, the four digit and single digit uh, um, seven segment, the, the crystal, the tactile switches, and then I'll come back and fish around for some uh, resistors here in a second. So first things first is I'll bend the legs. Um, now that was one I should not have bent the legs on so I will unbend the legs. So this is the uh, CPU and so it has to have one of the legs clipped. This keys the chip and makes it hard to put it in backwards. Okay, so once I've inserted it into the board, I will use a pair of um, needle nose pliers to just sort of bend over one leg at each corner um, to hold the chip in place. Next, I'll insert the maximum chip, and I need to just ever so slightly bend the legs in in order to make it fit. Um, there is a half moon on the chip that indicates where where the one side of the chip should go. Again, I will just simply bend over one leg. And these are just some Harbor Freight dollar, dollar ninety-nine needle nose pliers. They're nothing magical. Next, I'll insert the four digit. It's important to make sure that the decimals are at the bottom of it. Um, this chip is keyed so it only goes in one way. And again, I will bend this over. And now I'll insert the single digit. It is not keyed, so you really need to pay attention to where the decimal is. It needs to be at the bottom. I like to think on my 21st unit I've gotten a little bit good at this. Maybe a little too good. So those units are in. And now I'm going to drop in the uh, tactile switches. These will just snap into place. Um, you do not want to have your fingers behind them. They are sharp. It will bite. Um, so don't, you know, don't squeeze it between your thumb and your forefinger or you'll get poked by the four little uh, leads. So next I'm going to insert the crystal. And what I'll do is go ahead and bend over the leads to hold it in place. I'll do the red LED which goes on the right and then the green LED which goes on the left and the long lead goes in the center of these two and then again I will just bend over the two leads to hold it in place and now I'll pick three or four more components to insert among my passives so the, I just happen to grab the diode so I'll put the diode in place and again, I'll just simply bend these pieces over. And I'll put in some of my resistors. So I've got a 100 ohm resistor here. It goes down here. Let me see if I can find. There's a 1 mega ohm resistor. It has a green band on it. It's the only resistor with a green band. It is R3 and it goes up here in the corner. So I'll go ahead and insert this and bend its leads over to hold it in place. Now I'll grab one of the 10K resistors. They're orange, black, and brown. And I'm going to put R7 in over here on the left side of the board. And so this, this starts to get a little bit crazy on the back side. But again, this is... This is just the technique that I've developed after um, having assembled quite a few of these. I'm going to go ahead and put R6 in, which is also a 10K resistor. And R5, which is one, another 100 ohm resistor. 
So I, what I've done at this point is I've seeded the majority of the components and I'm going to fish out R8 which is a 20k resistor. It has uh, red, black, and orange. It's the only uh, resistor with a red stripe on it so it makes it really easy to find. So if you choose to follow the instructions, they will walk you through this one step at a time. This is sort of the four pass model. So next what I'll do is I have a pan of ice that is good and I'll just kind of squeeze this and stick this in here. And then I'll orient it so that I can start soldering. And um, next what I'll do is, is start soldering the leads. And I start with the passives. I clean the tip of my soldering iron. And then I just kind of work my way around and solder, solder the leads in a pattern that makes the most sense to me. And the reason I do the passes first is because if the leads are in the way, I can now push them out of the way once it's been so the component's been soldered in place. And this goes pretty quick. Um, I do have a ceiling fan running. So if you don't have a ceiling fan in the space that you're working, I recommend that you get a small fan and set it near you to blow the smoke out of your face. Um, especially if you're, you're working with uh, leaded solder like I am. Um, you really shouldn't breathe the fumes. They're, they're not good for you. Um, you can use lead-free solder. There's nothing, nothing about this that would make it incompatible. Um, I just happen to have a couple of pounds of uh, tin and lead solder. It's a very, very reliable solder, so um, that's what I'm using. Um, you do want to work with an electronics grade solder that's a very fine diameter. So here's an example of where I've soldered it, but the lead is in my way for the work that I need to do. So I just pick the lead up and bend it out of my way. And this is why you want to do the passives first. So now I'll start in on the ICs and I'm going to do the, pro the processor first. So I take the bent pins and I just sort of pick them up and hold them in place. And then I just work my way across the other pins. Um, I'm running my soldering iron a little bit hot because I'm towards, I really need to clean the tip and I don't have any tip cleaner. Um, so uh, it's just important that I move quickly. Um, and that's okay because, um, you know, when I'm assembling these, I, I quite frankly want to get through it. So I've managed to get cut this process almost in half with this technique. Um, and again, this may not suit uh, someone who is just starting out in uh, assembly or who doesn't do assembly very often. But I like this because it is quick. And it takes this particular task and makes it much more manageable.
And the way I have this oriented, I basically just pass back and forth on the rows of pins. And um, I think that's a little bit more efficient. You should, you, you don't have to use a soldering stand. Um, you don't have to use a pan of vise. I mean, this, this vise is probably a $100 component. Um, however, it is expressly designed for holding circuit boards and it's great because it gives me somewhere to steady my hands and it holds the board securely while I'm working on it. And periodically make sure you clean the tip of your soldering pencil or your soldering iron. And there again, you can see I just, there was a, a lead that was in my way, so I just push it out of the way with the siren iron. I don't really have to worry about it because the passive component has already been soldered. And then all I have left is the uh, single digit. And then I'll look over the leads and make sure I've got enough solder. If there's one that needs a little bit of additional solder, I just touch it up. And now at this point, I have soldered on all of these components. So I've got um, probably close to half the components soldered in place at this point. So now what I'll do is I'll trim off the leads. And the first step in this is just to stand all of the leads up that have been soldered. Sometimes these can be a little bit tricky, um, not a big deal, just pick them up. It doesn't matter if they're crooked or if they're bent because they're about to get cut off and thrown into the recycling bin. And uh, Just go along and clip them off. You can sometimes clip a couple of them off at once. Uh, looks like I missed one. Not a big deal. Um, I'll just simply solder it here loose because it's only one, one pad. And so I think this is pretty much a normal part of quality control is, you know, the nice thing about trimming leads is it gives you an opportunity to inspect your work. Now, the leads of the digits do not have to be trimmed, but I trim them because I like to keep leads as short as possible. It prevents any unintentional sh shorts. And I find that I can trim three to four of these at a time. So it goes really quick to trim leads on the back of these. And I trim both the single digit and the four digit uh, modules. Um, you want to make sure it's pointed away from your face because it does tend to uh, jump and go all over the place. The next thing I'll do is I'll install the 6-pin um, in-system programming header. And I just drop this in place and then I use my fingernail to catch it, hold it sideways, and then I set it down. 
this is a little bit tricky. Um, you want to start in the middle. If you start on one of the corners, um, there is a possibility that you will melt the pin and, and it will shift. So I work my way from the center out and the um, I try to work quickly on these pins. Um, sometimes they don't absorb quite as much solder and I have to hit them a second time. So one of the things I do is I also hold it down. So I'll solder the first point and then I'll push down and then I'll lift the pencil off to make sure that it doesn't move. Um, the next thing I do is I solder in the run program header and this one you really have to hold it down or it will it will screw up and again you need to do the the center pin first. So. Um, and the reason you do the center pin is the two outer pins don't melt and they will um, hold it still for you. It only takes a second for the solder to harden and um, then you can simply move on to the next, next pin. Okay, so that's nice and quick and simple. And um, now there are just a number of small pieces that need to be uh, soldered in. So I'm going to do the two um, 22 picofarad capacitors that go with the timing crystal. And what I do is I put them in and then I bend one lead on each one in each direction. And so it, it winds up, you probably can't see this here. Yeah, it's just not going to show up in the camera. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll insert um, some more of my passive components. So in this case I've got my R1 and R2 which are 100 ohm resistors. Doesn't matter which direction they get folded. I've also got R, R9 and R10 which are 10K resistors. And then as I turn it back over, I'll take and insert one of my two terminal headers. It's really important to make sure that the um, holes for the wire or the ports for the wire face to the outside of the board. And then again, you want to just, um, I recommend you start with a square pad. It tends to absorb heat a little better. And you want to just hold the board still as you pull the heat away so that it doesn't shift and um, you wind up with a installation you're not happy with. The circular one just for whatever reason tends to be difficult um, especially on this one that's off by itself so you just have to let it heat up and then you can solder it. Now I'm going to solder all my passives and again you can see I'm, I'm working with the board loose here um, you know, sometimes I'll take the additional step of mounting it back in uh, the pan of ice, but it's really not that big of a deal. It, it does slow you down if you are um, not, um, if you're working with the board loose. And, and here what happened is a second lead started to bridge, and so I spotted that and I went back and melted it and flicked it out of the way with the with the iron.
So I've got two more passive leads here. Okay, and so now I've got these on here, I'll go ahead and trim all the leads. And uh, at this point, the majority of the components have been installed. Um, now I've just got some of the bigger and more specialized components that need to be installed, and then this unit is done. So next thing I'll do is I'll install both of the green uh, terminal blocks. They go down here at the bottom. And again, you just install it, flip it over, make sure it stays put. I do like to do the square pad first because I find that it picks up heat rather readily. And then I do the circular pad. Um, these two do not tend to give me as much grief. The one that's off by itself, um, for whatever reason, that spot is just really hard to solder. And again, as I solder the first connection, I um, make sure to hold the board so that the, uh, the block cannot shift. Um, next, you need to bend the transistor. So you just take the pliers and do that. And then you pinch the two other leads together. And then this will go in relatively easy. Then I insert the relay, and I'll turn this over and do these two components together. The relay is like the other um, mechanical components. So as I solder the first uh, pin, I'll put my finger down, and then I'll lift off and wait for it to harden. And that makes sure that my relay gets soldered in place fully seated. Um, otherwise, you, if you don't do that, you can wind up with a relay that's sitting crooked. It's not a big deal if it sits crooked, it will still work, it just looks sloppy. And the resistor, the transistor is a little tricky to solder with the board loose like this, but it, it's absolutely doable. You just have to be careful on how you position your, your soldering iron, and then you have to work quickly. You do not want to overheat the transistor. Um, so I, I joke this is doing the work of three hands with two. And then what I'll do is I'll come back and trim the, the leads on the transistor. And I also trim the leads of the relay flush because some of these leads carry um, the control current. So if I'm controlling a 120 volt load, um, these are the pins that I specifically do not want to touch anything and short out. Um, next I install uh, C1, which is my um, filter capacitor for the load. And this just keeps, if you're controlling a motor, it keeps the motor from sending a surge of current back into the relay and shortening the life of your contacts. It's what I refer to as a quality feature. Next is the USB jack, and I like to make sure the pins are not bent. And then use care when you insert this, because if you're not careful, you will bend the pins, 
and in most instances once you bend the pins it's destroyed. And next comes the uh, power capacitor and the gray stripe goes towards the center of the board and now I will solder these eight connections. When you're soldering the USB jack, you want to go ahead and solder the small connections before you worry about the case connections. And then with case connections, you just um, straighten out your solder so you have a fair amount of it ready. And you just insert the, the tip and heat up the joint and then you just feed solder until you have filled that joint and then repeat with the other one and this consumes a fair amount of solder compared to anything else on the board these are primarily mechanical joints so um, you can use whatever solder you happen to have handy um, or just a lot of your electronic solder and so at that point all I have to do is clip these two leads and the unit is assembled and then there's a jumper that needs to be installed and so I've assembled this unit in 27 minutes um, including the the time it took to start the video then the next the next section of this is to hook it up to the ISP and to burn the bootloader and then to program using or to upload using the programmer and it will um, it, it will go live at that point. Thanks for watching. I hope this assembly video has been helpful and uh, that I look forward to hearing about your application for Tiny Timer.